Good afternoon, beloved. I'm so glad to see you all here today. Today we have the honor and the privilege of examining the first six verses in God's holy scripture of uh, Matthew chapter 11. Now, if we remember, for the first ten chapters, Matthew has told us who Jesus Christ is. He has presented him as the Son of God, God incarnate, the King, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of Israel, and the Savior of the world. Over and over again, he has reiterated that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Living Lord, the Son of God. Matthew has made every effort to do this, and he's tapped into every effective witness to the claims of Christ. Matthew has laid out all of this tremendous evidence, and now as we approach chapters 11 and 12, he has a new purpose in mind. Based on all of this testimony, what is the reaction of those who have heard and seen? Matthew deals with that in chapters 11 and 12. In fact, he lists it for us, the various kinds of reactions and claims to Christ, giving us a brief narrative of events in 11 and 12. He gives us various categories of the responses to Jesus Christ. These chapters are filled with very common reactions to the claims of Christ, which were true then or, and are also true today. For example, in the first 15 verses of chapter 11, uh, it, it deals with the response of doubt. From verses 16 to 19 in chapter 11, it refers to the response of criticism. And from verses 12, uh, 20 to 24 in chapter 11, the response of indifference. Now you notice I said nothing about the last section of chapter 11 because that deals with a positive <coughs> responses, the response of faith, the right response, and Pastor Richard We'll cover that, uh, so by the time we have covered this chapter, you will have all the possible reactions to the claims of Christ, both positive and negative. It's very helpful because you'll find, you will find out as we move through this chapter, we will be able to see the varying responses that are just as true today as they were then, and perhaps <coughs> you will understand a little better where people are coming from when they react to Jesus Christ. The first response that he deals with is the response of doubt. That's what we're going to look at for the first six verses today, the response of doubt. One might even call it a perplexity or confusion, but doubt says it better than those other two terms. When the New Testament talks about doubt, whether it's talking about it in the gospel or the epistles, it primarily focuses on the believer. And now that's very important. You have to believe something before you can doubt it. You have to be committed to it before you can begin to question it. And that's why doubt is a unique problem to the believer. If, we, if it was something you never believed in, it would be called disbelief or false truth. The New Testament terms that surround the concept of doubt are used for believers. This should be encouraging to us that doubt is something that occurs in the life of the believer. In fact, in James, it says, if you doubt, you're like a divided man, unstable in many ways. Unbelievers need to come to Christ and believe, but doubt does occur. Doubt is a matter that belongs in the life of the believer. That's the place where it fits. Now, not that it ought to be there, however, it is so. So, we are not so shocked to see John the Baptist doubting. All of this being said is to introduce us into the next, the first six verses. So, let's open our Bibles, beloved, and read together the first six verses of Matthew 11. Okay, Matthew 11, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, 
Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So let's just examine that passage just real quick, kind of go over that. <clears throat> Verse 1, after Jesus had finished instructing his twelve, he went from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. If you remember, in chapter 10, Jesus had taught them, he had trained them, he had prepared them to go out into the world and represent him. He knew that, ultimately, they would be sent out empowered by the Holy Spirit after his ascension, and the whole building of the church would depend on their availability and their ministry. See, verse 1 is more than a transitional verse to show how it shows how crucial they were. He had invested time in them, and now they were ready for their first training mission, for their first short-term training exercise. And after chapter 10, he sent them out, and they were to go and carry on the things he had stated to them in chapter 10. So they did that, and it says, He departed from there and went to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. He continued his Galilean ministry because he was a true leader. Having sent them out, he didn't just kick back and relax. He does his ministry too. This reveals his leadership. It also reveals his great heart for the work. Notice it says he went to teach and preach. Well, it was a twofold ministry of Christ, teaching and preaching, and they are different in the synagogues. The synagogue was a place where the scripture was read and exposited. The synagogue was a main feature there was to read and give detailed exposition of the scripture. Our Lord would go to the synagogue and since any resident expert who happened to be there could speak, he would take the occasion to speak and he would take the Old Testament and give them the meaning of the Old Testament and apply it to himself. He was an expository teacher. He was also a preacher. Now, that word means to proclaim. He would go forth from the synagogue to the streets and the hillsides, the, high, the highways and the byways, the corners and everywhere, and he would preach and proclaim his kingdom. So he continued doing this. We may also assume that based on verse 5, he continued miracles of healing, casting out demons, raising the dead, and forgiving sin. So the Lord goes on about his work. He's alone now. The twelve are gone, and they are out on their first mission. As Christ is ministering, we see in verse 2, he is approached by two disciples. Two, it depends on which gospel you're reading, but two disciples of John the Baptist, because John had heard in his prison cell about the works of Jesus Christ. John had been put in prison by Herod, Herod had married his own sister-in-law, and John publicly rebuked Herod's flagrant sin. See, he may have had some doubts about the Messiah, about Jesus, but he still lived up to his convictions, and he was not afraid of calling out sin. So John sends these two disciples to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Remember, John was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one who announced his coming. He was the one who said, Behold, the Lamb of God. He's the one who said, He must increase and I must decrease. John had already known Christ. He had already pointed to Christ. He had already baptized Christ. He had affirmed that his, he believed in Christ. And remember, they were also cousins. However, there were some certain things that caused him to doubt. So he sent out these two to say, is this the Messiah or are we looking for someone else? It reflects his perplexity and it reflects his doubt, even though he had affirmed his belief and even though he had known about Christ. The disciples of John 
had already been poking around the crowds and hanging around the edges and watching what Jesus was doing because it was utterly important for John to fulfill his task as the one who announced the Messiah. He wanted to be sure that the one whom he had announced had indeed been the Messiah, so his disciples stayed close to Jesus as well as to John. It also indicates that though he was a prisoner, he had some kind of access. They would come and see him, and John, John had a lot of followers, if you remember, but the ones who stayed very close to him and worked very close with him, he dispatched to follow Jesus around to be sure he was right. However, now there were some reasons for him to doubt, so he asked this question through his disciples, are you the one who comes? It sounds like such a vague question, doesn't it, right? Are you the one who is to come? Who's he talking about? Well, it sounds that way because our English text doesn't really say it the same way the Greek text says. The Greek text says, Art thou ho er chromenes? It's basically a participle, the coming one. It should be said this way, are you the coming one? And, of course, John MacArthur said we should write that in our margins and capitalize it. Are you the coming one? Now, I don't know if you all want to do that. That's up to you. But that's how important that phrase is. Are you the coming one? So we see now John, how John handled his doubt. He went straight to the source. He didn't personally go because he was in prison, because he couldn't but he sent his disciples. I just want to make that clear to you. He went straight to Jesus Christ. He didn't have the scriptures of God's written word like we do. Better yet, he went straight to the source. Now the coming one is the title for the Messiah. It's a messianic title like the branch, the seed of David, the king of kings, the prince of peace, the coming one, it was one of the most common titles for the Messiah. It was used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and it was used in John. It was used in the epistles, and it was first introduced in Psalm 40, verse 7, and Psalm 18, verse 26. The Messiah is called the coming one. If we go back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, then John the baptizer first speaks in the New Testament. He says, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. In other words, the coming one is the term John used to refer to the Messiah. In, chapter, in Mark chapter 1, it says John preached, saying there is one who, one mightier than I that come, cometh. The coming one, again, see, and because it's a constant title for the Messiah, he, is used, he used the coming one. The Jews clearly understood this, that it was a messianic title. So John is asking basically a very simple question. He's saying, are you the Messiah? Are you the promised one? That's the first question. And the second question is, or do we look for someone else? Are we still looking for someone else? This phrase indicates an element of messianic expectation but it also indicates that he was perplexed are you the coming one or are we looking for someone else so it's obvious John had doubts and that's okay in a sense there were reasons why he had these doubts and we'll see those in a minute but how John handled the doubts how he handled them he went right to the source to have his doubt dealt with. He went to the Lord. Why, did, why go to the created when you can go to the creator? Now you might ask yourself, didn't John believe? Yes, he did. The form of the question implies he believes, but he's having some perplexity, some be bewilderment. Something was making him not understand, and he was saying, in effect, should I continue to believe what I believe, or should I believe something else? It was if he was saying, I believe you're the Messiah. Am I wrong in believing that? In fact, because he asked Jesus to answer these questions indicates he had not lost his faith in Jesus. 
He would have never gone to Jesus for assurance if he had lost his faith. He, he went to the Creator for a positive declaration. Are you the Messiah? Please help me understand this. He didn't deal with his doubts himself. He didn't deal with his doubts by talking to other people. That would have just brought everybody down in doubt. He went to the Lord. His faith had found a complication, a bewilderment, a confusion. Now, we've all had these doubts, haven't we? We're all human. So the what here is doubt. John was confused even though he pronounced that Jesus was the Messiah, even though the things he predicted had come out of his own mouth from God, there were many things he didn't understand. So he sent his two disciples. Jesus answered them in verses 4 and 5 and said, Go back and report to John what you see in here. The blind have received sight. The lame have walked, are walking. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf is, have, can hear. The dead have been raised. And the good news have been proclaimed to the poor. In other words, go back and give him all of my credentials. Jesus answered John's doubt by pointing out the acts of healing. With so much evidence, Jesus' identity was obvious. If someone doubts their salvation or their forgiveness for sin or God's work in their life, look at the scripture. When you doubt, don't turn away from Christ. Turn to him. Jesus did a whole plethora of personal miracles and said, Here, these are for John. Go tell him. Go give him the good news. Not secondhand. Jesus just, Jesus just let his power fly and then said, Now you all saw it. You heard it. Go tell John. Clearly, those are my credentials. Then after verse 5, he gave a closing beatitude. In verse 6, he said, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The Lord is saying, if you want to be blessed, don't let anything I do or say lure you into a trap of doubt and make you stumble. You see, don't doubt. I'm warning you. Don't doubt, because if you doubt, you won't be blessed. It's a beatitude. Blessed is the man who does not doubt. And blessed is the man who trusts. It's a tender little rebuke, a gentle warning. This rebuke did not diminish the master's love for the prophet. In verse 7 through 15, Jesus gives the greatest testimonial to anyone he had ever given in his whole life and tells us, that this was the greatest man who ever lived up until that time. We'll cover that next week. But isn't that comforting to know that a man as great as this can doubt, and we see even though he doubts, his greatness is instantly reaffirmed. The praise which follows shows that his doubt did not diminish or lessen him in the Lord's eyes. The Lord still had great esteem for him. So there we have the basics of this passage. Now we, verse 3 is John's doubt. That's the what. Verse 2 is the how. How he approached his doubt. And he went straight to the source. He went to the creator himself. And verses 2 and 3, the why. Why was John confused? If we look closely, there are four reasons why John doubted. And it's the same four reasons why we doubt today. It's the same four reasons that we, sometimes in our own lives, we doubt God. Reason number one, difficult circumstances. Difficult circumstances tend to make us doubt. Humanly speaking, in the worldview, the career of John the Baptist ended in disaster. John was a fiery, dramatic, dynamic, confronting, bold, courageous man who preached exactly what needed to be preached, to whom it needed to be said, when it needed to be said, and he never had any fear. When he saw sin, he rebuked it, and he rebuked it in the person that he saw it in. He was bold, powerful, and aggressive, and that resulted in him being put in prison. He, shouldn't have, he should have been really careful who he rebuked, right? No. No, he shouldn't. He was a man of God. He was God's man, 
And as God's man, he had to do what he had to do when he had to do it, whether he liked it or not. Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, had paid a visit to his brother in Rome. When Herod was there, he took a liking to his brother's wife. So he seduced her and then returned to Galilee and divorced his own wife and married his brother's wife, whom he had seduced. Well, John the Baptist heard about this. He didn't write an anonymous letter. You know what he did, right? Right out in the front of public view, in front of the face of Herod, Antipas, he told him he was rotten, vile sinner, who was an adulterer, and read him the riot act right in his face, which didn't go over real big with Herod, who proceeded immediately to throw him into prison and would have killed him right then, except he was afraid of the people because the people knew John the Baptist was a prophet. So for over a year, he sat in the bottom of a pit, a dark, stifling, stuffy, hot dungeon without any fresh air. John lived in the desert, wide open spaces, with the, with the wind in his face and the sky for his ceiling. So for John, who probably never lived in a house that was now, he was confined within four narrow walls of an underground dungeon, this must have been pure agony. We can't criticize the fact that he questions, that questions begin to form themselves in John's mind. He was a true saint. He was a prophet of God. He was a great, holy, faithful, selfless, loyal prophet. He had done exactly what God had told him to do and he had done it well. He had announced and proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. He was even a close relative of Jesus. He had been filled with the Holy Spirit since the time he was in his mother's womb. He had taken the Nazarite vow, the highest level of spiritual commitment possible. Was this his reward? Was this it? You see, doubt comes from our inability to deal with negative or difficult circumstances. It didn't make sense to John. He had been so faithful, and John must have thought, didn't Isaiah promise in chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, when the Messiah came, he would free the prisoners and set loose the captives? What's going on here? This isn't the way it's supposed to be. Isn't there a place of blessedness for me, such, as a, such a faithful man as I am? See, our doubts are just like John's, right? We commit ourselves to the Lord God in heaven. We earnestly believe in the Lord is going to take care of us. Then something goes wrong, and we really begin to doubt. We lose a loved one, or someone we loved is crippled for life, or has a heart attack, so we, so we doubt. We say, God, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. You said you loved us. Loved us. You said you'd care for us. Is that not true? If everything doesn't go the way it should go, we begin to wonder if God loves us, and we fall into doubt. And once we start thinking that way, Satan gets behind us and just starts to push. We must remember our reward, our comfort, is not here on earth. We tie our worth to this world, and we shouldn't, but we do, we have to remember this world will pass away in our failure to see God's whole plan. And since we can't know the mind of God, we doubt God. We doubt that he still cares and loves for us. We lose a job. We lose a house. And we start questioning God. Difficult circumstances. John doubted because of unforeseen difficult circumstances. We doubt for the same reasons. But you know... You know what he did? He did the right thing with his doubt. He went immediately to the Lord. That's the place to go if you have doubts over those kinds of things. Go to the Lord. And yes, he began to stumble. Verse 6 makes that clear. So he asked the Lord for help. Help me out, Lord, with my doubt. He sent his two disciples to say, in effect, Lord, help me understand this. You see, the Lord was glad to respond 
and he even said, blessedness can come if you'll just trust me. Even in the midst of mystifying circumstances, negative circumstances are tough, but what we need to do is go straight to the Lord who will respond to those who struggle by replacing our doubts with faith. See, John went to have his question answered. We can go to the Holy Scriptures because the one who speaks to us in those pages is the Lord Jesus Christ. Doubt comes from difficult circumstances. Yes, it does. But that only gives us the opportunity to exercise our faith. Faith, when it's exercised, gets stronger. So in verse 6, he sends a loving rebuke. He says, now John, if you want to be blessed, don't doubt. Don't let anything lure you into the trap of doubt, not even difficult circumstances. I do care for you. Can't you see that by the people I've touched? And someday you'll be delivered, not in this world, but in the next. The, sec the second thing that causes doubt is outside influences. Worldly influences. You'll notice it says in verse 2 that John had heard about the works of Christ. And, hit, and this confused him. Everyone thought that when the Messiah came, he would first knock off all the Romans, wipe the Romans off the face of the earth, get rid of them completely, and give Israel back her land. Secondly, everyone thought there would be free food, instant welfare state. What Christ was doing didn't line up with what the Jews thought their Messiah would be. Everyone expected health, wealth, and instant happiness and bliss. Everyone thought that all the wrongs would be made right. Everything would be as it ought to be immediately in his kingdom. But his kingdom was never meant to be on this earth. You see, that was the expectation. And doubt is caused by outside influences, outside expectations, worldly influences. John had become a victim of the thinking of the day. It isn't supposed to be this way. I mean, Jesus is supposed to be walking around, isn't supposed to be walking around meek and mild and lowly, nothing much going on, nothing has changed, the wrongs are still wrong, the injustices are still here, sin is everywhere. See, John had become a victim of thinking the same way the people around him did. The disciples had the same problem. That's why in Acts 1, they said to him, is this the time you're, you're going to bring your kingdom? And Jesus replied, like he had many other times, it's not for you to know. Jesus had been with them all this time, and they still didn't know. He said in John 14, I have been so long with you, and you still don't know who I am. The Jews had also, had also had been confused. Their concept of what was going to happen in the world around them, they believed that before the Messiah would come, there would be a long string of it's a long succession of other guys who would come. After all these guys came, then the Messiah would be the one, the final one to come. That's why in Matthew 16, Jesus asked his, his disciples, Who do men say I am? And they, they said, Oh, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're a prophet. But who do you say I am? He asked them. And they said, Thou art the Christ the son of the living God. That reflected the current Jewish thinking that there was going to be a long string of people coming first. John began to think maybe this, maybe he's one of the guys before Messiah, before the Messiah. Maybe he's someone else. So John sent his disciples to ask, are you the one? Are you him? Or do we look for someone else? Where are you in this line of succession? John was even affected by this misinformation. The Jews expected the Messiah to be a certain thing, and it wasn't turning out that way, and there was confusion. In the same chapter, Matthew 16, when Peter said, You are the Messiah, later Peter rebukes Jesus and said, This will never happen to you, after Jesus told him that he must be killed on the, and then on the third day be raised to life. See, they really never understood either. The night Jesus was going to be betrayed and being taken away to be executed, 
they were all sitting around arguing who was going to sit on the highest throne and the highest point of the kingdom. Jesus was talking about dying, and them, and it went right over their heads, just like a low-flying plane. And then when Jesus was taken prisoner, Peter was so totally disillusioned that he went out immediately and three times did what? He denied Jesus. It really didn't make any sense to them at all. He told them many times, but their expectations were so different that he could not see it. We face the same causes of doubt today. We doubt because we are perplexed by God's plan. The world tells us what to believe. The world tells us what to expect. The world tells us what kind of God we should believe in. That's why there's so many false religions today. When you start letting the world dictate to you what God is going to be and what God is going to do, then you look at the Bible and you start wondering and you, and you really become perplexed. The world does not know God. The world does not know God's plan. The world does not know Christ. They do not understand who he is. The natural man understandeth not the things of God. If you begin to let the world force you to think that Christ must be who they say he must be, then you are going to start doubting. The solution to that, once again, is to go to him. Read the scriptures, see what he's done, realize that God's kingdom is not here on earth, realize that God has a power of reversing disease, reversing death. He showed it in his scripture. He's saying, can't you see I'm the one who's going to make it right? I have the power to make it right. I have the power to reverse the curse. Someday he will in his kingdom. These are but previews of coming attractions, a taste of what he will do in the future. Not here on this evil earth, but in his kingdom. Our reward is in heaven. The Pharisees in Luke chapter 17, 21 and 22 asked Jesus, when is your kingdom coming? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. You just can't see it. The Pharisees didn't know that it had already arrived. The kingdom of God is not like any earthly kingdom with geographical and geopolitical boundaries. Instead, it begins with the work of God's spirit in people's lives and in relationships. Still today, we must resist looking to institutions or programs for evidence of the progress of Jesus' kingdom. Instead, we must look at what God is doing in people's hearts. He said to John, See, I can do all this for you. I can stop disease. I can raise the dead. I touch the poor. I preach the good news to the hurting people. It's going to be all right, John. You just have to trust me for the right timing. And then he adds that little beatitude at the end of verse 6, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Be blessed by not doubting. Difficult circumstances influence and can cause us to doubt. The third reason we doubt is incomplete knowledge. It says in verse 2, John had heard what Jesus was doing and what was going on, but he did not see it in person himself. He had heard this from his disciples that had come back and said what they had seen. John was doubting because he didn't have the opportunity for a first-hand look. There's a sense of legitimate doubt because he did not have the opportunity to be an eyewit excuse me, an eyewitness of Jesus Christ's majesty. He didn't have the opportunity to see him raise the dead, heal the sick, or preach the good news to the poor. He didn't even have the word of the scripture as we have today. He didn't have complete knowledge. He didn't have a complete revelation. So John said, I need some first-hand information. Jesus said, okay, you need some first-hand information? I'll give you some. In Luke chapter 7, verse 21, and in that account, it says, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had disease, sickness, evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. Then, 
and I'm paraphrasing here, then he said to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have just seen and heard. Tell him what miracles I just did for you all. Now go. I did all of this for John. These are John's miracles, and our wonderful, patient Lord gave John what he needed for complete knowledge, for his complete revelation. How does that relate to us in modern times? Well, a lot of people doubt not only because they have negative circumstances or worldly influences, but they doubt because they have not seen God's complete plan revealed. You've got to know the facts. Christ basically said, tell John of all the things, all the miracles you have witnessed. In other words, give him the revelation, give him the complete knowledge, give him the manifestation, tell him what I have done. Our doubt is erased daily as we expose ourselves to the full revelation of God. Let God speak to you through his word. That dispels our doubt as the revelation of Christ in the scriptures. He reveals himself in the scriptures. We see the first-hand manifestation of the living Christ, and it comes through the pages of the Holy Scripture. Search the scriptures daily to seek God revealed. The fourth reason people doubt is because of human failure to understand unfulfilled expectations. We doubt because of unfulfilled expectations. In verse 3, John's disciples ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Why would John ask them to ask that? Only because Jesus hadn't fulfilled John's expectations? Well, Randy, you say, what do you mean by that? Well, John had preached about Christ, remember? He said, there comes one mighty, mightier than I, who comes with an unquenchable fire, who has a winnowing fork in his hand, by which he will separate the wheat from the chaff, this means judgment. In other words, John said the Messiah is coming in holy judgment. That was his message. Always, 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 John preached, repent, repent, repent. In other words, you better get your life right because the Messiah is coming, meaning if your life isn't right, you're going to regret it. He was preaching that the Messiah was coming to judge. He expected the Messiah to land with a blazing fire. John expected the Messiah to come Come and blaze evil things with a divine thunderbolt. And Jesus came and he collected a small group of 12, totally inept characters, meekly wanders around the, through Galilee. And John could not figure this out because of John's own failure to understand Christ. Christ didn't meet his human expectations. So John had unfulfilled expectations. Jesus was on a mission of mercy. John was a message of judgment. John was wanting, waiting for fire and fury and flames and wrath, and he was thinking, when are you going to blast your enemies? He sounds a little bit like David, doesn't he? In Psalms 9, 10, 35, 52, 58, all those psalms where David is asking God to blast his enemies. He sounds a little bit like the people under the altar in Revelation 6. How long, O Lord, are you going to tolerate this? John is thinking, if you're the Messiah, what's going on? Unfulfilled expectations. Really, impatience can lead to doubt. We expect divine intervention, but it doesn't happen. When you expect God to do something about that person in your life who is wretched, <laughs> evil, vile, and they seem to do nothing but prosper all the time, you say, how long, God, can you let this go on? It doesn't seem to fit our human expectation. I think sometimes we wait for something so long and it doesn't come, and we doubt, and we slide back into that superficial Christian, that Sunday-only Christian. It's true, new Christians get real excited and try to live every day for Christ, which is great, and that's how we should all live. But after a while, however, they slide back down. Those of us who have lived 40 or 50 years as Christians, sometimes we've been waiting so long for some things to happen, and they don't really happen, and we begin to doubt, and we backslide. This is what is meant by unfulfilled expectations. We expect things to happen on our timeline. 
not God's. And you know what happens? The same happened to John. He had all those expectations, and so maybe he said to himself, I wonder if he's really ever going to come. Is this whole thing true? But look what Jesus said in verse 4 through 6. In verse 4, he said, Go back and report to John what you see and hear. Verse 5, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who had leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Verse 6, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So why did Christ say all of this? Because John was worried about whether Christ was going to set up his kingdom. And those were all signs of his kingdom. It's a preview of the kingdom that is to come. These are all signs of his kingdom. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is, The works of our Lord answers the problem of doubt. If you doubt because of negative circumstances or difficult circumstances in your life, look at his words. They prove he cares for us in difficulty. If you doubt because of outside influences or worldly influences, look at his works. He's in control and someday will show it fully. If you doubt because of incomplete knowledge or incomplete revelation, then look at the works and study them and read his words and see who he is. If you doubt because of unfulfilled expectations or human expectations, look again, for these are all previews of what he will do in the kingdom. The best part of this story, the best part of this story is that John had his doubts removed by the Lord's answers. You know how we know that? Matthew 14, verse 10, it says, John was beheaded in prison. Verse 11, his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to his mother. Verse 12, John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Don't you just love that? His disciples took his body, buried it, and the first thing they did was went and told Jesus. They went and told Jesus because he was the most important person in John's life. They believed in Jesus because John believed in Jesus. Because John had made them believe in Jesus. The fact that they went immediately to Jesus is indicative that John was satisfied with the answer he got. Jesus fit into their lives. Jesus fit into their plans because Jesus fit into John's plans. Now that we know all about doubt, know this. 2 Timothy 2, chapter 2, verse 13 says, If we doubt, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. This is for the believer. When we doubt, God will be faithful. If you doubt, you are not going to lose your relationship with the Lord. He will be faithful. He cannot deny himself. He has affirmed that you are his child, and he will hold on. Knowing that, you can have confidence, and you can go to the Lord with your doubt, and he will give you his answer. Remember Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And we know that all things God, in all things God works for the good of those who loved him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now get this, verse 30. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, He also glorified. Wow. When you doubt, you're not going to lose your relationship or your salvation. When you doubt, go to Christ in prayer and supplication and look at the scriptures and read his words and be comforted. Let us bow our heads and pray. Father, we know that everyone's faith has weak moments. And we know that no single chapter is a full story in a person's life. 
We all have struggles. Thank you for what you have taught us through John's struggles today. Thank you that you taught us that you cared enough to make sure that he understood. You fulfilled his human expectations. You gave him complete knowledge. You helped him deal with outside influences, and you comforted him through difficult circumstances. You extolled him as the greatest man, even though he had doubt. That gives us comfort, Lord. Father, the sign of his greatness was that he knew where to go with his doubts. Help us know where to go as well, Lord. Help us go straight to your word. May we, as Paul instructed Timothy, pray without doubting that you may be glorified through our faith, Lord Jesus. In Christ's holy name, amen.